So for example, if omega is an unknown, omega plus one is an unknown. And the other definition is a limit uh, on definition. So if you take a set of ordinals, if you take the union of all these ordinals, then this is a limit ordinal. So we define ordinals that are successor, for example, omega plus three, and ordinals that are limit, for example, omega plus three. Okay? So I will spend my time now, from now, to speak about successor or limits. And there is a special case of zero, of course, which is considered as an ordinal, and which is also a limit ordinal. Okay, so I'm not going to talk too much about math, to be honest. I'm going to talk about algorithms and computer science from a mathematical point of view. And as a computer scientist, the first thing I do is encoding stuff. So I will, take a, I will talk about machines and tapes. And so we need to encode ordinals on the tapes. So I have to present you a way to encode the ordinals. So first, for people that don't know what means countable, it doesn't matter, don't worry. But we will only talk about countable ordinals. So quite small ordinals, depending on the point of view. So here, what I'm going to show you is that if I want to encode an ordinal by a sequence of zero and one, I can use the following trick. So what I do is that I set an index for every every cell of my sequence. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten here. And then what I do is, okay, I want to compare. I want to set 0 or 1 depending on an order. So what I do is I take the order type of the pairs. So I take the pairs, all the pairs of natural numbers, so this is countable ordinals. And I set that um, if the first coordinate is lower than the second, so for example, here, here we take x and y, and if this x is lower than y, then you set that it Encoding of this pair will be associated to what? So what we first take is an encoding of your pairs, for example the counter encoding or whatever is computable as for encoding, and then you associate to each encoding a value zero and one, depending on the order of the pair which is encoded. Is it clear? So for example here zero here is zero zero, is it pair zero? zero. For the counter encoding. And as zero is strictly is not strictly lower than zero. We say zero. For example, at one here, one is the encoding of zero and one. And zero is strictly lower than one. So it's one. And so one. So I can encode every ordinal like that, every countable ordinal like that. Is it clear? Okay, so this is the encoding that we use. Perhaps something I should add is that countable ordinal is a set, is a well order of n. So that's why you can use this trick. Okay, so now that we have settled some uh, some backgrounds, we can talk about infinite Turing machines. So an ITTM is basically a Turing machine that can compute along ordinals. And how we do that is that we carry on computing in a classical way for successor ordinals. Whatever you know for a Turing machine remains true for classical, for successor operations, but we have to add something else, which is a limit operation. So we consider here a machine having three tapes, input, output, and work plate and a single head for all the tapes. And for convenience, I use only white infinite tapes. Standard. To figure out what happened with, with that. So, what's the difference is that we will add a special limit state to deal with the fact that we have limit ordinals. And I will also consider that now I'm not indexing my computation state by integers, but I will go further and just in through the ordinals. So how it works? When you operate the machine, 
for any successor configuration to reach another successor configuration, the next one, it's quite easy. You have your operation here, and then you run your program, and you obtain your new configuration. So classical case. For people that download the machine, you just have a program that says that if your head in, is in this position, with this state, then you move to the right, you move to the left, you write to zero, or you write to run. So you can compute a program like that, dealing with zero and one, just following the instruction of your program. So a program is a transition table that explains everything. So here, for a classical configuration, to go to a successor classical configuration, it's the classical case. Nothing is new. But, now, what is interesting here is that when we are talking about infinitum time meshes, we want to go through the early modes. So at least we want to be able to compute omega. What happens at omega when we have um, computed during all the integers and that we want to carry on computing, we reach the omega steps of computation. So, for example, for the omega step here, what we do is that we look at the tapes, cell by cell, and we do the limb sub for each, uh, each cell. So what we basically do is that we say that the content of our tape at a limit on the wall is zero in one cell if it was zero at a certain point. Uh, stage of computation and that it remains zero. Otherwise, it's one. So, ah yes, and what we do also is to we take the head and we uh, rewind it. Rewind? Rewind. Rewind, thank you. We rewind the head to the first original cell and we change the, the state and we set that this is a new state. So now we can go to the transition table the program and look at the column and say, what do I do when I'm in the mid state and that I read a zero or a one? So the person tells me, say, go to the left, go to the right, go to the right, and write zero or right in your side. So the only difficulty here is to take cell by cell the limits of what happens before. So this was for omega. Now, if you are reaching omega times two, for example, you do the same, and you do that for your whole history, not only your last omega steps of computation, you do that from zero. So you still have to remember everything you have seen before. But it is not so complicated, okay? It's just a definition. And this is not the best definition of the world to compute on it because it's cell by cell. You don't have any global behavior. Okay, is there a question here about the model? Okay. So, this machine is interesting because you can decide a lot of things. So, here in red is what a classical Turing machine can decide. So, any classical system can decide. In yellow, there is the arithmetic uh, hierarchy. <coughs> and in blue, we can see what an ITTM can decide. So it can decide sigma 1 1 and pi 1 1 problems, which is quite convenient. But we don't know what are the limits of these machines. We know that this is a fragment of delta 1 2, but we don't know anything more. So this is still lots of years. But at least it can decide pi 1 1 and sigma 1 1, which is quite interesting. You mean you don't know, you don't know any? Properly, say one want to say that, that cannot be decided by No. No. So, yes. So, a question that is most of the time asked is, okay, if this machine go to through the ordinal, through transfer time of computation, when this machine, when does this machine have? What is the happening of such a machine? And my answer is, this is a classical happening. So, in the classical case, when you have a Turing machine, you have to when you reach a housing state, or when you are about to reach a housing state, depending on the convention. So you have to see that you have the age in your state, in your head, in the state of, as a state of your head. 
Here, this is the same. So you can have, for example, at omega times 3 plus 7, just because you have reached a halting state at this moment. And what is interesting here, and why I probably said that I don't care about non-comfortable ordinals, is that even if you are going through the ordinals, you have a looping pattern if you if the are among the countable ordinals. So depending on your input you can be co-final in omega one, but you will never reach omega one. Omega one the pattern that you can find at omega one will be found before. So you can only be with countable ordinals. So you only compute during a countable number of steps of so these questions are not so over. They are nice, but they are not dealing with strange cardinals or whatever. So we may be all on here. And what is important here is at this machine world during an infinite amount of time, if you give an infinite input to your machine, your machine can read the whole input. So depending on what you are going to give to your machine as an input, you can have a huge difference. So what we do here, to be sure that we are not computing too, too strong stats, we consider that we are dealing with zero as an input, or a finite input. So we are sure that the machine is not having more power than its natural structure. And when we talk about the halting problem of this machine, we talk about the halting problem on input zero. So this is important, yes? Is it, just to make sure that I understand, there still are just a finite number of states? So yes, machine, yeah, there okay. is a finite number of states. Mm -hmm. Yes, you just have practically one more state than the classical transformation, so it's a finite number. Mm -hmm. So we have to see an important remark, right? That everything here is finite. Everything in the definition of finite TNL is finite. There are finite number of steps, uh, finite number of steps, one head, and the finite number of uh, states uh, in your head. So the structure remains finite. What is transfinite is the fact that we add a limit operation so we can go through all the modes. But everything is finite. So, as we are going through all the modes, we are going to distinguish two kinds of ordinals, two natural notions of ordinals appear here. Is that the ordinals that correspond to halting times of computation. So, for example, I have a program that has in omega times three set of computation. So this ordinal, omega times three, is a clockable ordinal. It can be a clock or program that has. But I also have another notion, I, not I, but people that work in this domain, we have another notion in that, okay, when I had, I finish an output, a sequence, a binary sequence, an infinite binary sequence. And this binary sequence can potentially encode an ordinal. So the ordinal that is encoded by this sequence is called a writable ordinal because it can be written by the machine. So we have clockable that, have, that correspond to halting times and writable. And what is interesting is that these two kinds of ordinals have the same supernova, which is called lambda, and which is a very, very large comfortable ordinal. So for people that knew admissibility theory, this is a uh, recursively inaccessible ordinal, which is a limit point, so this is a uh, fixed point, so this is a lambda such uh, recursively inaccessible ordinal. So this is a very closed ordinal. So, is yeah. it the least? Is it the least fixed point? Yes, it's the least such fixed point. Oh. Yeah. This is lambda. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. well, I think this is an interesting ordinal, but this is not the point of my talk today. So I just say that this is a rather large countable ordinal in general. So writable and clockable ordinals have the same supernova. The question is now: Are they the same ordinals? Is every clockable ordinal writable and vice versa? Mm -hmm. 
So the question, the answer is that they are not the same. But before to explain you why, I have to explain you a little bit how this work, how this ordinals work. So, for example, if you take a clockable ordinal, you can use it as a clock because you know that you, can, you have a program that will have in, for example, omega times three steps of computation. So, if you want to compute something during omega times three um, steps of computation, you compute and in parallel you launch, you work your program that lasts omega times three. And when your program that lasts omega times three stops, then you know that you have computed whatever you want during omega times three steps of computation. Like um, sand, I don't know what you say it in English. Our glass. Our glass. It's like an hourglass, exactly. And we also have another theorem that says that, in fact, you don't really care about successor or ordinals in this case because you have a speed up lemma, speed up theorem that says that whatever you can do in alpha plus n and integer stage of computation, then you can do it in alpha stage of computation. So when you are going to take an hourglass, an hourglass, you are going to take only a limit hourglass. That will be enough. And what is interesting here is that I'm not going to enter into the details, but when you have a clockable ordinal, this is an ordinal, so this is an order on the integers. So you can use it and go into it and empty your orders, so look for the first element, remove the first as the smallest element. We can look for this. Set on this element, remove it, etc., and then count like that. So this is how your hourglass is working. And this is very convenient uh, with these machines. So clockable ordinals are very useful and we are only going to deal with limits. Now I can promise that uh, this ordinals will be the writable ordinals will be as interesting as a clockable one because in fact what we are going to see is that they are more writable ordinals than clockable ordinals. So clockable ordinals are very nice because they have a structure, you can do things with them, but in fact everybody is not a clockable ordinal. You can find gaps. So in your structure, contrary to classical Turing machines where every integer is a halting time, here you have some ordinals that are too complicated and so you cannot have during this halting time. So you have gaps in your computation uh, times. And what is true is that every, every clockable ordinal can be written, but every writable ordinal is not so, um, it is a well order, but it's not so convenient to use as a well order, and so you need too much time to deal with it. So you will have that. So this is not so intuitive compared to classical computability. Here you have to deal with the fact that sometimes you cannot be sure that at this time your program you will find a program that helps. And this is one peculiarity of the structure of IT exams. So a gap looks like that. In red, we have the beginning of a gap, a size that we have to determine. And the end of the gap is again in black a clockable ordinal. So the beginning is not clockable and the end is clockable. And here in this plot that I'm going to present to you is how what we can say about these gaps and how we can say things about these gaps. So first question is I'm sure that there are gaps here. How can we prove that? And the proof is quite interesting because this is an algorithm. And this is what we call those tables. So you run a universal machine, a machine that can run all the program. And what you do is that first you only care about limit steps of computation. So at each limit step of computation, each um, vertical line here, what I do is I check if I can find a program that helps. Okay, I have an infinite amount of time. I have a countable number of programs, so in omega step of computation, I can check every program. So
So I just do that. So I still the first problem. Does it, is it helping in the horizontal line, black line? No, it is not helping. I check the second program. Is this second program helping? No, everything is fine. Then I check the third program. Oh, in blue, it is helping. So I can find the program that helps at my, at my limit, and I am limit. I can find the program that helps. So I'm not a gap. I'm not a beginning of a gap. Okay? So I, I just wanted checking. Am I the beginning of a gap for each limit? And finally, I imagine that B time in red here is a time for which I can find I cannot find any halting program. So that means that beta is a beginning of a gap. Okay? Just imagine beta exists. And that no program has a beta. So it's okay. At beta plus omega, I have the information that every program that I have checked is, is not halting. It's like a for loop for one, two, omega, I check each program. And then, and then at beta plus omega, I have the answer, and I can halt my checking and say, OK, I have found the beginning of the gap. OK, and by the speed up lemma I said before, that means that between beta and beta plus omega, there is no halting program. So that means that beta plus omega is a clockable on one, because I was on input zero, and I stopped. So beta plus omega is a halting time of Turing machine. So I have beta, which is not a beginning of the gap, and I have beta plus omega, which is a, which, which is a clockable on the node. So I have found a gap having size omega. OK. And this is, this is OK, but there is something that is not clear here. That, but I have never said that this algorithm is working, in fact. I have just shown you an algorithm, and you believe me that this algorithm works. But perhaps this algorithm is just never happening. Because if such a thing of that does not exist, what happened? So let's suppose that we cannot find any such beta in red where nobody has. Imagine that my algorithm is just never finding the fact that there is always a program halting, at least one program halting at any step of computation. So, okay, let's report that. So, I mean, finally reach uh, lambda, which is a supremum of clockable ordinals, because the in the supremum of my clockable ordinals, it is not a clockable ordinal. So, no program has can have at a, uh, in lambda step of computation. So lambda is a beginning of a gap. So okay, that means that at lambda I can check that I have no problem hatching. But at lambda plus omega I can find I can hatch and say that okay lambda plus omega is a clockable ordinal. Which is a contradiction because lambda is a supernum of clockable ordinal. So if there is no gap, I have a contradiction. So there must exist such a beta like that. So this proof is quite nice because this is one of the main, uh, this is a basic idea that we are going to use in uh, infinite time uh, work in general. Not only in that talk, but a lot of results are based on very of this proof with more complicated stuff involving uh, sigma one substructure, blah, blah, etc. But the idea behind every, not every proof, but a lot of proof in the field is running programs like that and doing some checks and uh, verifying some properties and how to. So this is one of the main ideas I want to share with you. So is it okay for everybody running a lot of programs together? So we went one step, yeah? So are all the gaps on mega long? Sorry? Are all the, how do you, uh, are all the gaps on mega long? No, that's a very nice question. So I need to explain you in a few, in a few slides that no. So how, how, why, why did you know that there's a, 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 a free by constriction for the lambda plus omega? How do I know that you might have? 
because you the two by contradiction each other. Like, so is lambda. Lambda is a super model with right. flexible ordinates. So lambda is not flexible itself. Right. And if it is not flexible itself, that means that my check that my loop for i to omega is a gap number i hat will will fail because you can say, okay, none of my programs had it. And thus, at lambda plus omega, I will have the answer that none of my check was working. None of my program was had it. It is, I can, is there, um, is there something to write on the board? Thank you. Perfect. So I have a set of tools. For i to omega to okay, I'm not a real computer scientist because I'm a <laughs> But that's okay. And for and here I do for omega check if so program is I T T N. I suppose there is two N. If program number I is hat. And what happens here is that by some algorithmic stuff I I have the answer for each program you can do whatever you want, use a counter, whatever. Here I have my answer, yes, uh, one program is hunting. Oh no, nobody is hunting. And yes, one program is hatching means oh no gap. And you are set because you're looking for, for a gap. And here, no, nobody is hatching means yes. You have a program, you have a gap. And you do that for each limit. For each limit step of competition. I have said that nobody is hunting. I have a gap starting at Viva. So this is a general problem. Now suppose that each time I do that, I can find at least one program hat. Which is what happened with the classical termination. Then I find a program hat in two steps of computation, yes. Three steps of computation, yes. Yes, so no gap. But with infinite term to emission, it is not clear. Okay, a priori you don't know. You want to check. And when you check, you suppose that, for example, you can find one program halting every time. Okay, so if you find one program halting every time at lambda, which is a sub of clock levels, By definition of being the sub, you are in that case. So that means that you have something like that. Here you can find each for each limit of program halting, but at lambda you start a gap. But still I am not a true computer scientist. The complexity of this loop is omega. That means that you will need omega set of computation to check each program. Because your check needs a finite amount of steps of computation, and you do that for each program. So it's a complexity O of omega. Okay, so here you need omega steps of computation to do your check. So your answer that omega that lambda is a is the beginning of a gap. You have it here. At lambda plus omega. 
and by definition, you have one program on input zero, and you have here with your answer. So that means that this ordinal is clockable. But this is not possible because this is a sub. Here, lambda is a sub of the clockable ordinal. So this is a contradiction. That's where you can find the next gap if you start at the end of the gap. Exactly. So now that you exactly here, imagine you have found a gap here. You can run your process again and find another gap, which will also have in, in, that will also have size omega, etc., etc. But we are doing with our limits, so with limits. So with limits of limits, and limits of limits of limits, and limits of limits of limits of limits. So what will happen is that sometimes we will have limits of sequence of gaps, and those gaps are in a size greater than omega. And I'm going to talk about it right now. Is it clear? Okay. So now we are sure that this gap exists. So it's not just a UV of Joel and Pankins or myself or whatever who is work, whatever working on, whoever working on the subject. This gap exists. And what we will say, what I'm going to say to you here is that the literature is saying a number of properties about this gap. So I'm going to recall you these properties. So first, exactly your remark. Above an equal ordinal, I can run the same process and thus prove that the first gap above an equal has size omega. And what is interesting is the next theorem that says that, in fact, I can find gaps having the size I want. Every writable ordinal, so every ordinal below lambda here, can be a size of a gap. And I think I have a figure. So here you have the first gap having size omega. And then for every alpha, you can find a gap having size alpha. Because in fact, in your process here, when you check, you can do other things than checking. You can check, but you can also run a process, for example, um, Counting through an ordinal. So you can take a order and look for the smallest element, the skinny element, and look for the next skinny element, etc. And so you can run a process that lasts an ordinal. So you can do other operations in parallel. And thus you can prove that you can find gaps having size alpha for every writable alpha. And another interesting properties of gap is if alpha is a writable ordinal, the ordinal type of gap having size at least alpha, or even exactly alpha, but, uh, yes, exactly alpha is also working, is lambda. That means that you Below lambda, you can find as many gap of size alpha as you want. So it's in the structure. So you believe that you have halting times. Okay, let me go on here. You believe that you have halting times, but in fact you have lots of gaps. You have many gaps in your structure. Each size of gap is called final in lambda, so this is a summary of what I'm saying to you. But what we don't know here is, okay, what is the what is the face of ordinals begging gaps? What is the face of gaps? What is the face of ordinals inside gaps? So I'm going to show you a little bit more about these ordinals. So first. I need to talk about admissibility. So admissible ordinals are very well closed ordinals. So for people that do regression theory, 
classical regression theory or higher order regression theory. Arduinos, admissible Arduinos are Arduinos that are cool to compute the norm, but are so close that whatever you can do as an operation, it will remain below your Arduino. So more concretely, or more formally, a limit Arduino, or an admissible Arduino is a limit Arduino such that if you go from beyond, from above, sorry, uh, from below, uh, so alpha here is admissible if two conditions. First, it is a limit Arduino. Second, whatever an Arduino that you can take below, you cannot reach alpha by segment one on the ratio. This is the idea. So precise definition is if an Arduino alpha is admissible, if and only if there does not exist a function f from an Arduino below, we can so that f is unbounded, that means that f has no greatest element in alpha and f is sigma one definable in alpha. So, next definition. Uh, I don't know if people know the L hierarchy here, the golden hierarchy, but in set theory there are lots of hierarchies, but two main. First, V, this is hierarchy that say I take the, the empty set, then I take the power set of the empty set and the power set of the power set of the empty set, etc. And then we can build all the sets based on the empty set. And this hierarchy is quite cool because you can build all the sets, but the power set is sometimes a little powerful. You can take a lot of things. And Google. Uh, introduced a new hierarchy that was L. It's not take all the previous sets, but all at, a, at each step, in fact, of computation, you can you take only the set that you can reasonably define knowing the previous steps of your, of your hierarchy. So this is a death operation here. And for a limit step, for a limit uh, rank of your hierarchy, you take the union that you have defined before. So that is the key of this definition. And what we use to define something reasonably is that you can have a definability is the fact that you can find a formula such that um, X is definable on your model M with a um, with your language. So here's the language will be in the appartement. Okay, in. Uh, so this is a sigma one definition. So that's what we are going to use in that in that hierarchy. Um, I don't want to be into the detail because it's not so comfortable. I want you to to know that what we are going to do here is that we can define a sigma one formula, the function f that we are talking about. That means that, for example, dealing with ordinals, we can add two ordinals, multiply two ordinals, etc., etc., do reasonable operations. Is it clear or not? Okay. So, why am I talking about this admissibility notion? that because the ordinals that they can get are admissible ordinals. That means that when you are here, the beginning of a gap, or here, it means that an ITTM can do stuff here, but cannot do stuff for Y here. And this is because when you have this notion of sigma one definability uh, on my slide, on the blue slide. Is because admissible ordinals are closure ordinals. So, and as an ITTM are linked to set theory and a computation model, it is quite logic that twice it is coherent to have the fact that some very close ordinals correspond to non computable stuff. 
and I try to do my proof. And my proof, I went to my advisor and said, my proof is wrong. I'm going to show that there exists a gap. Have you said it's vacant? What's wrong? Um, nothing was wrong. That's life. So I was very surprised. And such gap exists. And there are a lot of such gaps because there are also co finals in Honda. So you can find very few gaps. And for people that who know Marine Cow, I don't know who knows Marine Cow, it's a German person uh, which is a lot working on ITCM stuff and transplant and stuff in general. And we showed that, in fact, we can do some worse things, much worse. So we have beta something, here, more beta than beta zero. So that you can, let's say beta zero. That is not the same. Here, you can find a gap, which is such big that you can have beta zeros admissible inside. So my scale is wrong, it should be something like that. So just to give you an idea, when you take an admissible ordinal, this is a closure ordinal. So the next admissible ordinal after it has a go, for example, or wrong. After any admissible ordinal, it's very far from your admissible ordinal. Because you can use your previous admissible ordinal in your, in your basic elements of your formula. And so you can compute a lot of stuff. So each admissible ordinal is very far from the previous one. Okay? And here, I can describe gaps having this number of admissible ordinals inside. So this is huge. Just so I can't imagine it personally. I can't figure out what it looks like. But this is just an uh, enormous gap. So there are gaps everywhere, and they are bigger and bigger and bigger. I have also another property, which is not so interesting, but it's nice that before beta zero, so this ordinal is interesting. This is the first baby lambda. So before the first baby lambda, everything is fine. Okay, this is a, a world with unicorns and windows. Everything is beautiful. And after it's hell. <laughs> so you can you can describe the structure like that. Here it's hell and here it's unicorns. Why? Because before it has a group, you can define a function that maps every ordinal alpha to the beginning of the first gap having size alpha, and this function is increasing. So the first gap having size omega times 3 occurs after the first gap having size of omega times 2. And after the first gap having size, having size of omega times 2, you have a lot of gaps in the size of media because you have to get with ordinals. And as we said a few minutes ago, after each calculable ordinal, we can find a gap in the size of media. So the structure is very nice. You have a lot of gap of size omega and a lot of gap of size omega times 2 with gaps in the size of omega between. And then your first gap of size omega times 3, etc. It's so a well ordered structure. Everything is fine. But after beta 0, you can find gaps greater than, lower than the This order is not preserved, so we can find big gaps occurring at B4 gaps at the small size. So this is nonsense. So below beta zero, everything is fine, and after beta zero, everything is nonsense and very big. So the structure is very hard to define. So this is the only thing we can say. If our beta zero, the structure is regular after it's still open work, but we, we have examples of things going very bad. So this was the fact that uh, beta zero is a day longer. And so this is the end of my thoughts. So what 
what I want to say here is that I think I am I'm not only again these dream machines and living cooperation. This is more than that. This is a model, or not a statistical model, just a computation model for algorithm that can prove logical properties. Because this algorithm, this kind of algorithm, we can talk about a hierarchy of animals, of enmiss we can talk about admissibility, we can talk about the L hierarchy, we can talk about a lot of uh, set political concepts. And it looks like a little bit messy, but it's quite easy to write this kind of loops. You have loops, you have okay, you have to define what happens um, completely with your tapes. But when you have done that once, you can reuse your library. So you have an, an ITTM library, which is an abstract one, and a free library computer, that you have high level primitives that you can use. And, so, and you can describe a lot of properties with simple loops and properties on ITTM. So I think this is an interesting point for sharing these machines and encouraging people to use them. So yes. This is my bridge between computer science and, uh, and mathematical logic. But there is still a lot of work to do. For example, I think we can use this machine to characterize admissibility. So admissibility is characterized uh, in different ways. For example, we can say that the deliver an L hierarchy uh, such that they correspond to a term of equilateral are admissible, so the ranks corresponding to this label are admissible or not. You can, do, you can say that, you can use the definition I have shown with the sub slides before, but that still remains classical mathematical definition. And I think that we can use ITTM, an algorithm and a more computer scientist approach to talk about admissibility, and then have something more easy to use from a high level point of view. The point is that it is quite complicated because of the hell about the table. So we introduced with Merlin a level of, um, level of admissibility. So if you are an admissible ordinal and a limit of admissible ordinals, you are recursively inaccessible. So you have rank zero or rank one. And then if you are a limit of social limits, you are rank plus one, etc., etc. So you can talk about admissible ordinals as limit of other admissible ordinals. So you can talk about gaps between being the limits of other gaps. And so try to find a way to properly define what means to be admissible. But the point is that here you can find a lot of admissible ordinals inside a gap. So that's not, that is not such an easy work to do. So this is an open question. So if you have time, I'm interested. So it's need to do in that direction. And other thing um, that has to be done, and what leads my work in other um, field, is that I think that gaps can also be found in other transfinite models of computation. Because what are the gaps of the admissibility theory? So they are present in other fields, in other notions, and in particular in other transfinite model of computation. So how can we define this gap? How can we better understand how they work to still define admissibility? And the last point I want to talk to you is that ITTMs are interesting, as I hope I have showed you, they are quite fascinating because you have a lot of counter things that are not intuitive at all. You believe something, you try to prove it, you prove the contrary. And it happens every time with the machine. You, you can't have any intuition because you are dealing with limits of limits of limits of limits and so such strange behavior happen. And okay, they are interesting by themselves. But I think this machine can be a very interesting model for other fields of math and computer science. Because a lot of people are living with transfinite recursion, transfinite iterations, transfinite objects in general, and they cannot really deal with them. They do some approximation or they do some mathematical theoretical stuff that are okay, very nice, 
But when computer scientists need some practical stuff, it's more harder for them. And I think that this model, which is quite abstract, okay, this is transfinite and ordinal stuff, can be helpful for them. And what I try to do currently in my position and what I try to do in general is to establish links with other directions. So with computer model analysis, with ensemble analysis, with uh, currently differential equations that are used in a lot of fields. And with dynamical systems, with discrete dynamical systems, continuous dynamical system. So I try to use this machine as a framework to be a way to express things in a more easy way for a lot of people. So I hope I have convinced you that it's interesting. And thank you for your attention. Thank you.